Hi, Don White here. I'd like to report today on some research we've been doing within the Carbon Capture and Storage Project within environmental geoscience. In particular, I'd like to report on the Aquastore CO2 storage site, some time-lapse seismic work we've done there, as well as monitoring for induced seismicity over the past five years. A variety of people have been involved in this project. Uh, in blue, people from uh, NRCAN, as well as a number of different Canadian research or industrial partners, two Western universities, as well as some international partners. The Aquastore CO2 storage site is located just north of the U.S. border near Estevan, Saskatchewan. There, CO2 is captured from SAS Power's coal-burning power plant and delivered to the Aquastore CO2 storage site. As of November 2019, the Boundary Dam power plant or capture facility had captured 3 million tons of CO2. Most of that goes to the Weyburn oil field located to the north and is used for enhanced oil recovery, and we get about 10% of that value at the Aquastore CO2 storage site. So geological storage of CO2 is not only applicable for coal burning power plants, but can be used for any significant source or point source of CO2, including refineries, upgraders, steel plants, or cement plants. The GSC research has really focused on two aspects at the project. That is methods for monitoring and methods for monitoring induced seismicity. And the research is used to inform the development of regulations and international standards and in the development of effective and efficient CO2 monitoring tools. This is a bird's eye view of the Aquastore storage site. To the right, you can see the CO2 capture plant. The red line represents the pipeline that delivers the CO2 to the storage site. And the lines of green dots represent the permanent seismic array that has been operational since 2012. It is an array of geophones uh, covering an area of two and a half by two and a half kilometers and has been, is the main tool that has been used for monitoring over the past five years. The CO2 storage reservoir is located at a depth of about 3,400 meters. Uh, above it, by about 1,000 meters, is a thick evaporite layer that forms the regional seal that would impede any upward migration of CO2 if it were, if it were to leak out of the reservoir. There are challenges involved in monitoring at the site. In particular, it's a very deep reservoir at over 3 kilometers depth, and the amounts of CO2 that are injected are relatively small by industrial standards. One of the advantages, though, is that we've had eight years of experience at the Weyburn site. The arrow indicates the level at which CO2 is injected at the Weyburn site. Also, advantages at the Aquastore site are there's uh, minimal infrastructure, the monitoring installations are permanent, and the land use is primarily agricultural. Prior to the start of injection and monitoring, of course, simulation work was done to try and determine how the CO2 would behave in the subsurface. This is an image of such a simulation which shows the CO2 spreading out in a number of layers within the reservoir. And I should remind you that the CO2 is not spreading out in a vacuous cavern, but in fact, this is a solid sandstone layer that has a porosity of about 10%. CO2 injection at the site started in 2015. This is a graph of cumulative CO2 injected. And of, as of January this year, almost 300,000 tons of CO2 had been injected. The times corresponding to seismic time-lapse surveys are indicated by the red arrows and correspond to quantities of CO2 of 36, 102, 141, and 272,000 tons of CO2. In this slide and the next few slides, I'll show you some slices 
through the time-lapse seismic volume. And in particular, any changes that we see in the seismic we expect will be caused by CO2 in the subsurface. So we've focused in on the reservoir layer in this slide. Starting in the upper left corner, uh, at the location of the injection well in the center of the slide, we can see some evidence of the development of a small plume, although at that stage it was not very convincing based on the sensitivity of the 4D seismic. By the time we get to 102 kilotons, uh, over to the right, the main plume uh, has developed further. It extends for a couple of hundred meters to the north of the well, and there's a secondary plume in the lower part of the reservoir. By the third survey, which was quite a bit noisier, the main plume continues to evolve, and you can see some sporadic false anomalies in the rest of the image. And then in the January survey, acquired most recently, we not only see the main plume continuing to grow, but we see for the first time evidence of CO2 in the upper part of the reservoir. You'll also note that there's no convincing evidence of CO2 sitting in the zone above the reservoir. We can consider those same volumes, but this time looking at plan view maps at the reservoir level. And on the left is at the time of the first time-lapse survey, you can see the CO2 plume extending northward towards the observation well by 102 kilotons. The CO2 continues to spread and is about 200 to 250 meters from the injection well. However, you also note that it doesn't seem to be spreading to the southwest of the inje injection well, indicating that the geological structure is largely controlling where the CO2 is spreading. In the last two surveys, you can see the plume continuing to grow as the amount of CO2 increases, and uh, the same geological feature uh, continues to control the north-northwest, south-southeast spread of the CO2 plume. Finally, we've also been doing uh, monitoring for induced seismicity as shown here. And um, you can see that even during a high rate injection test that was conducted just a few months ago, um, as I'll show you in the next slide, we have seen no evidence for induced seismicity over the full five years of injection. As well, we've calculated that the uh, sensitivity of the seismic array should show us any microseismic events that have local magnitudes of about zero to minus one. So very small events indeed. Uh, I'll skip this slide because of time. And to conclude, uh, the time-lapse imaging shows the CO2 plume growing within the reservoir. We can see the CO2 within distinct vertical zones, or sorry, vertically distributed within the reservoir. We see the influence of reservoir structure in controlling where the CO2 is going. Um, the ambient noise levels uh, do affect our ability to monitor the CO2. And finally, we haven't seen any induced seismicity over the first five years. Thank you.